Hi guys, welcome to uh, back to class. Uh, we're going to be talking about some more advanced modeling techniques today. I want to I want to show you guys a couple models and props that I've put together for different jobs that I've worked on um, in the industry, and I want to just go over a couple basics on approaches. Okay, so I have four models I'm going to show you. This right here is called a swarm bot. Um, this is something that I had to to work from script. I had to draw this out first and get it approved and then I had to model it and make it functional so it could be animated. Um, this was for a uh, Avengers commercial for um, that was going to be aired in I think England and Europe and there was a part in this in the script. There was also there's I should have brought in the helicarrier. We had a big helicarrier that someone had worked on and then in part of this sequence um, there is this big robot, Gigantimo, who I'm going to show you in just a minute. In fact, here, I'll pull him up real quick. Okay, we'll take a look at him. I have four of them. So here's Gigantimo. Okay, we're going to take a look at him. I'm going to talk about a couple parts that make him up. So this is really similar to what part of your um, current project is. Okay, in terms of all you have to do with your robot is make one arm, one leg, and part of a center mass, and then you're done. Okay. Um, and then what I also want to show you is I want to guide you through. Uh, here's another robot that I sort of, I just did this for fun. Um, this was something that I was working on. Um, a studio I used to work at used to have this themed night, themed drawing session every week. And one night, one week they picked robots. And so I sat down one night and I cranked out this. I had some parts and I pieced it together. And I had this, a buddy of mine had this idea about a robot that would throw like big saw blades at people and cars and stuff. And so I, I came up with this thing and pieced it together. What was cool about the majority of this model comes from numerous other pieces, which was a lot of fun, okay? And then I'm going to show you, I'm going to pull up this model here. This is the interior of a location that was a science garage, okay? I'm going to break down a couple of those parts and talk to you about those. So first, I thought it'd be easier to sort of go through a couple of these and talk about some, some do's and don'ts. And then I thought towards the rest of the, the lecture, I would talk a little bit about nerves, show you what a nerve is, how you can manipulate it, how you can change it, the benefit of using it. But most importantly, what we're going for is we're trying to create more complex shapes. So that's what this whole lecture is sort of about. So your goal now is to not be using primitives anymore. Okay, so we know what the what the Maya standard primitives are, right? We have the torus and you know the circle and the cube and the cylinders. Okay, we can use parts of those to start but then we want to extrude edges and faces and start com start creating our own complex shapes, okay? For example, let's say take like this back piece right here. That's a nerve that I used. Okay, I'm going to show you how I did that and see how nice and smooth it is. Now you create these nice little hard edges. That's something that nerves can be really great for to use. Also, this shape in here, okay? I had to have a leg shape that would hold this housing. Now, um, luckily, I don't do rigging. My mind does not have that capacity to go to a certain area. But I worked with a guy on this project who was a rigger, and he told me certain things, you know, like to make sure this hole was big enough so the upper leg could move just a little bit. And then we had the lower leg that was going to move. Now, the legs don't move too much. What this thing would do in the script is that in the center of Gigantimo's chest, um, after he was attacked, and then there's a part where I think Wolverine and Spider-Man knock him down, the chest opens up as like a last defense mechanism and hundreds of these swarm bots fly out and attack the Avenger characters, okay, inside this TV commercial. Okay, this TV commercial was set up for, what is it? There's a big museum in England that's really famous. I forget the name of it. That has like wax figures and, and stuff. Anyway, that, that's who the commercial was going to be for. And so I had certain guidelines I had to follow. One of those guidelines indicated that... Um, when these guys would pop out, they would fly from little tubes. So I had to find a way that, and we wanted razor blades. We talked about that. We wanted to have a series of razor blades that would pop out, that would act as um, the, the basic flight, call them like the helicopter blades or the blades. Okay, so basically this guy would pop out like this out of a little tube, and I'll show you that tube in a minute. And as soon as it come out, those blades would just be like, if I command Z, they just boom like this. They would just tink, 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 and they'd all fling out. And this thing would just be like, Vroom! and it would just take off, and then it would fly. And what it would do is it would land. And as soon as it would land, it would try to put a little bit of its, you know, little 
I don't want to call them paws, but it's little legs. It would sort of try to attach, and then the back end here had an injector on it. And that injector would then reach down and inject into Spidey, and it would cause him to go sick and whatever. So that's what you get. You don't get too much information sometimes. Everything I described to you was a paragraph in a script. That's it. I'm like, well, now what do I do? So I sat there, and I have to work with an art director. I start drawing. And I, you know, and I made comments. I said, you know, are you imagining this is bug shape? Is it pure mechanical? Is it, you know, is it, is, what, is it look round and heavy? Does it look thin and light? There's so many directions to go into. So what I did, and I was talking about this in an earlier class today, is I put together a reference page. So in um, my character design class, I was talking about gathering reference, which I did. I went and gathered a bunch of reference, and look, I put it on a page. So. Whenever, if I'm doing character design or something stylistic, I go grab reference material and I put this on a page. Here is another sample of reference of different cat faces I grab. So then when I'm drawing or designing, I have something to look at. Not only do I have something to look at, but now I have material that I can show to an art director or somebody else. So building a reference page is really, really important in anything that you're going to do. For our class, I go ahead onto the blog and I put reference up for you to give you sort of a head start. If you want to make your own pages, print them out, that's a great approach. But what got me to this point is I was able to show them, I had this idea about a wasp looking like bug that would inject a poison because the, just the term swarm bot, that's what they called it. When I think of swarm, I think of wasps. Even though bees swarm, but I just kept thinking of, of wasps. And I actually, when I lived in Chicago for a couple of years, I actually was attacked by a wasp's nest. I actually disturbed it, and then like one wasp came and got me in the leg, no big deal. But then I didn't realize when one wasp gets you, it lets out a little pheromone, and it tells all the other wasps to come get you, and they smell that pheromone, and all of a sudden I had like 15, 15 wasps like coming in to attack me, right? So I took that, and I went and I, some of the, the reference I put up on my reference page were pictures of um, different types of hornets and um, I put a couple bees there are some bees in the world that look a little bit like w wasps too and I put some variations and then what I did is I just did a couple comps some silhouette studies and some other versions and I showed them that when they saw that reference page immediately everybody was like that's what we want something that looks like that something that could land put its claws into spidey and then it could inject the poison and be good to go so that's sort of how this guy developed. But then there were a couple of solutions. Where they, um, the art director wanted it to make look, look like there's some type of an engine on the top. So I had that idea of putting that little vent up there. And then I put these little ribs, which I, I actually had that idea when you look inside a computer a lot of times, you have a part that has these little metal ribs that cool it down. So I thought maybe this cools it down a little bit. I had a little, now let me hide this bottom plane here so you can see this, okay? This is more of the angle that we would see it at. Okay, this is important. So in the middle here, we put a little radioactive symbol. So these were supposed to be like little radioactive small flyers. Okay, so we were going to see this. I was talking to the board artist. We're going to see it coming in like this quite a bit. So Spidey would look up, and there'd be a shot where we see this thing come in, and then it lands, and then we cut, and it's there's like two or three on his neck, and he's trying to swipe them off, and he gets stabbed. So it was important in that design process not just to be looking at it from here, we didn't see it here as much, but to be thinking about how menacing would that feel looking at an angle like this. So when I gathered my reference and I looked at spiders and black widows, I liked the way their bodies sort of opened up and the legs came out. So I tried to apply some of that into my design process here to have that feeling like, you know, this is not friendly. Okay, and then in, in terms of shape language, I really looked at shapes of, you know, I was looking at hornets, I was looking at scorpions, Okay, and a couple other animals, and I combined some of that in there. I was looking at the legs of a scorpion. Um, usually a wasp leg doesn't quite go like that, so I was mimicking a little bit of, you know, scorpion, a little bit of beetle, uh, base of like a, you know, this base back here is sort of heavy like a black widow. And then the, since they have the marking on the belly, I thought it'd be cool to have that marking right here of the radioactive symbol. Anyway, I'm going to show you the shape a little bit later right in there, okay, how that's made. Um, and it's, you know, it's a pretty basic friendly shape. Let me go ahead. I'm going to pull this over to the side here and oops, let me grab the right arrow. Oh, it's turned. So let me hit just freeze that. It won't let me, oh, it won't let me freeze the transformation. There it goes. Alt F. Nope. 
So I'll just bring it over like so. See if I can just show you real quick, okay? So when you look at this guy, okay, it's just a base shape that was created, but when it gets smooth, that's how I got it to get some of its detail. So what I did is I started with one of these. I just made this little section here. I duplicated it, inversed it on this side, connected them, made it then to a halfway, duplicated that half and attached it. So when I hit the smooth button, that's how I get that nice sort of smooth shape like that, okay? Now it's just a part. So I mentioned this before in a couple of my Maya classes. You need to think about not just designing the whole character, but take it in, in solutions and steps. Design the particular part you need that's going to emphasize a part of your design. Then go back and design the next part, okay? So, you know, the, when it's all, when it goes back to its rough blocky mode, you can see, you know, it's just, you know, it's a real simple cylinder. Um, it's actually started off as a cube, and then I just extended this stuff out. I, if, if Watch my arrows. I duplicated that part to make this part, inversed it, attached it, made some adjustments there, and then duplicated that, and then attached it together. And we'll go over that a little bit later today. That's how I did that. So if I hit Command-Z and bring it all back together to where it plugs in, okay, when it's smoothed out, if I hit 3 and make sure the whole guy is smoothed out, it does what it needs to do in terms of finishing the model, the look, and the design to it. The one thing that was a real pain in the butt was this. Right? Uh, sorry, let me get independent. There we go. Was having to do that. I had to take... They wanted some type of etching on it, but they didn't want to do it as a texture. They wanted it to feel like it was like... I forget, my art director had something that looked like... I don't want to say like a pipe, but it looked like it was like molding edge. And so I just had to take a a piece here and I had to basically mold it and wrap it around the body and stick it in there and then you could see that oops that molded top then comes up here it wraps around and then it even goes around right here there as well and conforms over the body okay so that was doable it just took some time I had to get in there and I just had to move little bits and that's another nerve that I use that was really fantastic to use nerves for that is very easy and then I can convert them back to poly and that added a lot to the you know the finish of that particular model okay alright so that's model number one let me close that one down okay and uh, let's go back and take a look at um, Gigantimo real quick okay so when I worked on this parts of this guy were already developed okay from another modeler um, uh, somebody else had worked on part of the shoulders and then I my job was to do this I got him as a full model. My job was to, let me see how this is grouped. My job was to just do what was described in the script. Was he gets it, so the person that built him didn't do any of this. I had to go in and dissect them all up. His, when he gets hit, first of all, there was one part, don't ask me why, one of the executives had this grand idea of, I'll do my executive voice. I'm sitting in a meeting, I got a great idea. His mouth opens up. And a machine gun pops out when he's angry, and he starts shooting people. Okay, so that was the executive, right? And, I mean, and I'm like, really? A, a, and just, you know, executives. A minigun comes out of the mouth, and it's almost like he's hungry, but he's trying to get people. I'm like, oh, man. Okay, so I was like, so, you know, you just do what you, what you have to do, right? So we did that. There's the minigun that pops out, right? I know. It's pretty insane, okay? And I thought this other part was cool, that when he gets hit... And he basically goes into his dying mode. The chest plate does this. So, so there might be a couple. You know what? That's ungrouped. That's okay. Um, the chest plate right here in the front goes like this. Uh, well, wait. Let me back up. First, these little elements right here, okay, they unscrew. And they go, I don't think I can even make them unscrew because I don't have the, I just got the, I'm l you're lucky sometimes to get your model from a company. Sometimes they keep all that and you're not allowed to take it. So sometimes you have to accidentally forget it was on your drive, but you might have another version that's not, you know, all grouped up together. So what happens is these little parts here go, and they unscrew. This unscrews, and then after that unscrews, the chest goes like this. And when that does that, it goes, and all the steam comes pouring out of the chest, right? So I had to figure out, because someone else modeled part of this, I had to get in there and mess up the chest. The chest would pop forward, and then after it popped forward, the chest would go like this, and then it'd go, like the sound effects, right? 
And then I had to do all of this in here. I had to make it work. And see, there's the swarm bot. Okay. So just that one swarm bot, see how many there are in there? I, it, it's funny. I was, the producer's like, yeah, and then it's mechanical, and then all these swarm bots come out, and they attack Spider-Man. And I'm like, I'm like, in the back of my sign, dollar signs are going off at how long it's going to take to have somebody animate this and render it and do the whole shot and what part's going to be seen. But that, it doesn't matter. I did my job. So my job was to dissect him up, add some other parts, and, you know, get in there. And so, look, that's everything that I put together. I had to do all this. I had to make hoses. I had to make it look like it was real. This whole inside was hollow. There was nothing there. So I had to make it look like a machine and like it was robot-based and all that good stuff. And then, of course, you see, I, I don't even, it's funny because, boy, this was a pain to you. They're like, we want a, uh, a hexagon or a six-sided hexagon shape for it to fly out of. And I'm like, oh, inside of another hexagon shape. So you have to figure all this out. So um, I went through, and I had to basically figure out how to model all that and make it so all these swarm bots. So every one of these holes had a swarm bot in it. And they were supposed to all fly out and attack, right? And so that's what it did. And then they would go out, and then they would kill Spidey, and that was sort of it. So I had to figure all that out. The reason why I wanted to show you this model, they also, again, minigun happy, put another gun on his arm, right? I'm like, really? And they were just like, then they started having ideas of, of Army Navy versions of, and then they got carried away. And then the head producer like slapped them all down back into, you know, and said, let's stay focused on what we're doing. We're not doing, you know. Anyway, so um, I just thought I'd show you a couple of shapes like right here. See, that's just a, I think anyone in this class should be able to sort of make that shape. You see that? That's just a cubed poly that's been folded over with some edges on it. There's nothing major about that shape. But when we hit three and smooth it, we get that. Not to mention there's a little metal shader on there. There's a light metal shader that gives it that sort of glow, which is sort of cool, okay? But this is what we're talking about. We will talk about how to make this piece today, okay? So look, all that is is a basic cube, okay, that has so many intersections it's been curved. They extruded out the edge to create this sort of jagged edge. So that's, that's back to design theory here, right? If I have a happy character, happy characters, Kylie, happy robots have round shapes. Mean robots have jagged edges, okay? So look at the jagged edges on there, okay? So, but the cool thing is, is when you smooth this. So if I take a look at this shape here, which, by the way, is the same shape as this. They're just overlapping each other, okay? So when you see it smooth, you see how nice and fancy it looks. It's not that fancy. It's just a simple poly. It has 563 vertices. That's it. Okay? So there's nothing wrong. Let me Command Z get that back into shape there. There. There's nothing wrong with, with using, see here's that same piece there. It's just upside down. And then here it is, opposite direction, a little bit longer. And then here it is stacked on top. There's nothing wrong with creating one piece of geometry that you can then manipulate and adjust and reuse two or three more times and make it look different. Like part of the garage, right? Huh? Like part of your garage. Yeah, it's like part of I did that in a lot of the garage. In fact, what happens is that when you do a lot of modeling, you start building your own library of parts. And there is this sort of gray area in the industry still about you using your, your parts. So you can sort of, here's the gray area, right? If, if you're working for DreamWorks, they have a proprietary system where they have things that work a certain way. Well, a lot of times when I, if I do work, I know I do a ton of freelance, I do stuff and just turn it in. I usually give them the model, but then I, I have accidental copy that stays for my own ability to render or whatever. But then I could go back in and I could use parts of a model. And so a lot of you in here have built other models. You've built other locations, sets, vehicles. You should be going in and grabbing all those parts. What I like to do is I line them up in a row in Maya just like I line up my primitives and I line up all these parts. So when I'm working, I look at parts and think about how can I reuse something and save myself time. Your end goal is to be able to produce something quickly and save a lot of time, right? So coming in, being able to take little parts, and sometimes it could be like the stupid of, the smallest of parts, you know? I mean, look at that. That's a, that's a pretty cool looking shape there, right? It's one piece. That's the base. Let's smooth it up. When it's smooth, look at how cool that is. Okay? It's pretty insane, huh? 
that started and then you know you come back in and put that little detail in there when you're done modeling the base of it you'd be amazed at how you can use you know parts of a finger that's small here how you could reuse that i mean this guy didn't model 10 different fingers he modeled one end cap for one finger and then he used that 10 other times right gee what's underneath that finger if i hide that it's the same end cap. So you have to learn to think about modeling smart, reusing your shapes, and that'll help guide you through part of your, you know, your progression, okay? All right, so honestly, I, this happens sometimes, you're working on something where you get stuff handed to you. A lot, part of him was done by a couple other modelers, and then I get it, and then I put my two cents into it, and then it went to somebody else who did something, and that's just what happens sometimes, it's not fun when you get to work like that, you know, this is pretty cool. This guy, uh, I didn't do this piece, but this is a hard piece to make right here. Putting those little octagon holes in there, getting those sides in there to get it to smooth and be that accurate. It's really hard sometimes to get nice round shapes inside an object. You just have to take your time, think about how it exists in a rough format. And there you can see rough. It is a one, two, three, four, five, six, seven sided little punched hole. Oh yeah, people, you have to save, look at this face just changed, that's supposed to be. Oh yeah, I mean, you're working on stuff all the time and you have to modify it and, uh, excuse me, you have to save because what I do is whenever I have one key part, once I get up to a certain level, and I'll do this in a couple of minutes for you, we'll build a more complex shape, okay? When I'm building something, I'm afraid I'm gonna mess it up somehow, so I duplicate and keep its original form and then I work off of the duplication. And then if I master that and figure a great solution, and there are times where I will like work on something and be pulling my hair out where I can't get it to come the way that I want, you know? And then there's other times where you get it to come and it just, it works and it, maybe you're just having a good day or whatever. And that's the thing about Maya is that everyone works different in Maya, especially in modeling. And there's an old expression, there's 10 ways to skin a cat. So I might, remember I talked about making modeling things in Maya, calling them chess moves? right, how it might take you like four to six moves to get to where you want, maybe eight or ten moves. Then you sit down with somebody else who has a clear mind who's refreshed and they can do it in four, but it might have taken you ten. That's okay, there's nothing wrong with that. I told you guys about a guy I worked with who every command never used hotkeys and he would go like this, mesh, extrude, and he'd go up there and then he'd come back, he'd do something, he'd touch here and then he'd go, okay. And then he'd do this and he'd go back and I'm like, oh my god! You have no hotkeys. You can't just press buttons and, and twill around Maya and have a good time with it. That's the best thing is hotkeying and being able to go around. And he would just go, nope, that's not my style. Excuse me, window, you know, and he just, <coughs> excuse me. All right, so that's, a, that's Gigantimo. Okay, let's hit not, let's close him down. And then let's come back here and um, let me throw this guy up here real quick. So... I had to, I really wanted to have round shapes with him. So I took round shapes. I put some uh, other shapes around the edges here. I like having little loops around edges so it's not just a distinct hard edge. Uh, what else did I do in here? You know, I had to put together the saw blade um, and, okay. It doesn't only, it's, I made it like trying to make it somewhat low. It's a little high res, but that's okay. Um, See, there were other saw blades inside there that would pop up, and then the arm could reach back in there, grab a new saw blade, and sort of throw it out. Um, I, I put some time into considering how, now that I look back at this, I did this guy really quick. I would have put more beefy leg muscles and joints and hoses, you know. Um, I sort of cheated a little bit. I sh I, what I should have done, but here's a time constraint. And again, this was for fun, okay, so I built them really quick. Remember on, on your blog page here, let me pull it up for you. One second. Uh-oh. Sorry, I'm trying to get this Safari window up. One second, let's pull up Safari here. Okay, start, 106. This is why right here in the very beginning, oh, did I take it off? I did. I think it's on the bottom. Oh no, it's under that. Okay, I'm gonna post that up to you. That's our next. There. That's why I posted this up for you. It's an anatomy chart. 
I did that really fast. I should have spent more time looking at at the quadriceps, at you know the the tibialis antiquus, that front muscle, the the the, the calf muscle, and replicating those as not as muscles but as robotic parts. Does that make sense? I would have had a much better outcome on that leg. See, that's way too thin up there. Now I look back at it and I'm like, okay, I know I cranked it out in like a night and a half. You know, I worked on it when I came home from work, and I just got it up on this this blog. But um, you know, it's just a little blog competition. This should have been much thicker than this. That doesn't really feel like you know calf. That doesn't feel like quadriceps. I should have had another muscle that comes out. That's part of the shape and design of the human body that I sort of should have incorporated. That arm I already modeled for another location. We'll see it in just a second. So I already had that arm available. Um, I'd already modeled this helicopter right here for another show. So I was able to just pull that helicopter out. I just bent up the blades. You know, I used some parts of that, so that was easy. Okay, so again, we're using parts to your convenience, okay? All right, now let's jump over here. Let's take a look at this guy. Okay, this is a science garage that I made. Um, let me take off the resolution gate, camera settings. Let's take off that resolution gate, no gate, so we can see it all, okay? Now, don't get, I know it looks like there's a lot in there, well, there is, but if I zoom up in here, yeah, there's props and there's a certain story around all this. Okay, however, though, this is what I wanted to show you. Let me back from that, okay? That just wasn't made overnight. Uh-uh. I did that first. There is a series of sketches to figure out the shapes of the props that were going to be in that room. Okay, I figured out... I designed and looked at beakers and bottles. I created reference pages and I figured out the shapes I was going to have for a lot of those little props around the room. After I did that, I even started thinking about what the center was going to be like. See that sketch right there? That was very influential to me, having this part that comes down and having this in here as to how the center mass. The, these were the cabinets, the board in the back. These were other shapes I was thinking about designing. Okay? What I did then is then I did a couple thumbnails. Or I just drew up a couple ideas, real quick thumbnails, figuring out how I wanted the room to sort of look and feel. Okay, here's the benefit of drawing. Then I went and I looked at my thumbnails and I started modeling those props. Going, looking at my thumbnails. So if you look at this shape here, this beaker with that little windy guy that comes out there. Look at this guy. This guy was like a, I was looking at an espresso machine. I thought it would be different if it looked like it had these little pointy elements. Look at this guy here. Okay, so if I go back there, you can see those here. You see that shape right there? See this guy with the lines on it right there? This guy was like my broken record player. I was just thinking of funny shapes, and though all those shapes were started to get represented. See, that's the record player guy. Okay, so all those shapes influenced that build, which influenced that sketch. And then later I even did like a quick color comp of what I was imagining the location to be. Okay, so then... I had a lot of this work done right here. Oh, I don't think I showed you. Wait, hold on. I skipped the first page. There. So then I made these shapes. These shapes were also in that sketch. There were the taller shapes with beakers, crazy wires, okay? And then I had, those are robotic arms. I reused those, I reused those robotic arms when I made that other robot real quick. So I have all those parts available. I still have those parts available. This was sort of stylized. You can see the the distortion of the shape in there. That's probably some of the influence of working, you know, back at Big Idea. Okay, I was not a modeler at Big Idea. I was only modeling rough pre viz sets for them. And then I was drawing in their concept department, okay, in Viz Dev with Michael Spooner. So anyway, you could see, I just want to like to show that because you can see that progression on how these shapes influence part of my design process. Okay, that's why I'm having you guys try to create thumbnails now. I was a huge asset still am an asset to companies because I come from a drawing background. I was trained as an illustrator. So when I can sit and draw and use that language to communicate with reference sheets to a director, that puts me three or four steps above my competition that come right in that go, well, I need a drawing. I, I don't model without a drawing. And that's not the approach you want to be. You have to have the, ab the ability at least to draw rough shapes, even in an orthographic view, communicate with those shapes and with your your reference pages and then you can get a lot accomplished very quickly okay all right so let's go back here sorry guys I'm not trying to make this into a super long lecture just there's a lot to cover okay 
So um, let me just zoom around in here, you know. So I made all these props separately, and then I put them in here. Okay. Oh, wow, it's huge. Let me in group. So look, I had, and then once I had one bottle, I was able to make a mo another bottle. I wanted the bottles to be uh, dual layered, okay, so that way when they render, I can tell the light on the infraction settings that there's two layers of glass there, so it might create another type of um, illusion. So I made sure it doesn't one piece of glass. I made sure I had little, like little details. Like I put these, I was looking around at some blenders and other elements I had. So I made sure I had screws with the little Phillips heads on them. Um, just made sure like the controllers and the knobs would stick out just a little bit more. So it was, it was a little bit more visible. See the silhouette on the side of that, how it looks like a finger could just like hit that it would just like click on or off, okay? So I made sure I tried to encompass all of that into my model to get all that done, okay? All right, so that's, I mean, and again, I modeled this in sections. So if I take this right here, okay, hold on, and I do this, I select everything and I hit hide real quick. I modeled that separate. That was the upper light system. I wanted there to be numerous lights around there with little vents. I wanted there to be these robotic arms that would that would roll around the outside of this and I created two different tracks so there could be one arm doing one thing and another arm my whole idea was the scientist this is part of a pitch I was working on okay would work inside here and he'd be able to go and you know these arms would be moving around while he's in the environment it's almost like he'd be thinking and there'd be so much busyness happening you'd hear the arms in the back like picking up bottles and moving stuff and pouring beakers and it would add a lot to part of the design process, okay? Here, let me hit display, show all. All right, so with that said and done now, let us um, let me open up an, another, I was trying to see if there's any anything in here to grab to really look at. I even had a trash can with old parts. Let, let's go in and we'll start talking about a couple shapes and then we'll talk about nerves. So let's go in, let's do something really quick here. Let's go file new, start with a new scene, okay? All right, and um, let's dive in here. Let's just start with a really basic shape that we have, okay? Let's start with a cube. Let's build part of that shoulder piece that we just saw on Gigantamo, okay? So I just created a real base cube here. I'm going to bring them up. So what I can do once I've created that cube, I can come over to the natural inputs here, and let's just go under height here. Oops. Let's go to subdivisions of width. I'm going to put, let's say, about four in like that, okay? Actually, I went to five. So how I did that, some people forget, little you know, reminder, by selecting the outside description, just touching it, and then middle mouse drag, it'll put numbers in there for me. Do you see that? So I'm just touching the description, subdivisions and height, and then I can just slide this across and it fills the number in for me automatically. Sometimes I touch it and you know, and I'll be like, oh, just you know, I want two or three, whatever I want in there. Okay, so let's do that. Let's do subdivisions of width. I'm going to go to about four, okay? And, uh, oops, let's go back to perspective view. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to stretch this out a little bit like so. Let's bring it down to about here, okay? I admit, I'm a little rusty. I haven't worked in Maya for a good couple months. I've been doing more drawings lately um, for freelance, okay? All right, let's start with basics. Start with extruding, okay? I'm going to come here with face. We're creating more complicated shapes now. I'm going to come here. Um, I've just, I have a couple hotkeys set up so I don't have to go back up to the top all the time. There, if you check through, make sure you have your shape selected. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to my hotkeys for extrusion, in K, which is if you, if you guys forgot, it's back up here under edit mesh, extrude, okay, or something. There's a lot of other commands under here as well. I just have his hotkeys, okay. I'm going to extrude these out, okay. I'm going to put them up, push them up a little bit. Now that happens sometimes where Maya does that, and if it does, I just go back to the normal arrows and then I can pull them in the same direction, okay. Now that that's done, I'm going to extrude them again, and I'm going to pull them out a little bit. I'm going to close that up a little bit more, and then I'm going to pull them back a little like so, okay. I'm trying to mimic that shape that we just saw a couple minutes ago. Okay, um, now let's come back here. Let's go to, I'm going to select this. So let's say you're building part of your robot and you want to make a nice shoulder pad for it, right? So I'm going to select that. I'm going to extrude. Okay, I'm going to pull these out a little bit like so. I'm going to hit extrude again. 
as I pull it out, I'm going to tighten it up a little bit more like this, and I'm going to ex maybe extrude it one more time, pull it up to about here, and then pinch it off a little bit, okay? All right. Now, that's just a flat shape, right? So what I need to do is I could bend it, okay? Hopefully some of you guys haven't forgot some of this. What are a couple of different ways that I could bend this shape? Soft select. Huh? So soft select's one. What's another way? Lattice form. could put a lattice on it. And then someone said the third way, deform. Okay, I have a couple different options, so let's do all three. Why do I want to bend it? I'm going to bend it to be the shoulder, right? So right now I'm in one. Okay, I press my one button. It's my basic blocky shape. If I hit three, look at what it turns into. Ooh, it's starting to get pretty cool. Okay, it's starting to smooth out. I haven't even put any detail into it yet. Okay, so let's talk about bending that shape real quick. Just as a little bit, I know you guys had the break. It's easy to forget stuff, right? So number one, I could come down here to get to soft select, right? Let's hit our move tool. And if I, by double clicking the move tool, it brings up the tool setting box. If I scroll down here, and where is it? That's reflection setting. There's soft select. If I select this right now, okay, and then if I come over here, and if I go to vertices, and I need to see what my fall off radius is, but let's select these vertices right down the middle right here, like this. So you can see right now nothing else is illuminating, so if I come back over here and I adjust that fall off radius a little bit, just bumped it up ever so slightly. Now if I go to move that, you can see what's happening is it's adjusting the bend of that. Now, how it works is that when it, whatever goes to, that's actually sort of cool because it's putting another little bend in it right there, okay? So if my fall off radius, let me command Z and go back, and, oops. If my fall off radius, so watch, we're going to raise this a little bit more. So it's all yellow. Look at what happens now. There's barely any move in it because I'm going from the, these colors right here. I'm going from yellow to an orange to a red, and then black is nothing, okay? So if my fall off radius is too low like this, let me get it right about one, yeah, about there. See, the outside edges are not going to bend because there's no illumination there. Now here, see, only the middle would bend. But if that's the shape you're going for, that would be in your best interest. You can use soft select that way. So you just got to get a little familiar with adjusting you know, the settings in here. I'm thinking of rounding the whole thing. So I'm going to put it up about, about right here. That way when I go to bend this, I have the whole entire piece. It starts to get a little bit of a bend into it. And I sort of like that. Okay, I'm done. I hit soft select. And then now my geometry stays. It's in one piece like so. And if I smooth it, I can take a look at it and see um, what it's looking like. Okay, that's pretty cool. All right, let's go back to this one. What's another way we can bend this? Let's put a lattice onto it. Okay, so how do we get to lattice again? Some of you might have forgot. If I go under polygons right here, I go under the animation submenu, I come over down here, and um, I'm automatically going to, where's lattice? I have a hotkey, so there it is. Lattice, okay, and if I hit that lattice option box, okay, it brings up the box, which asks me how many intersections I want to have in there. If I put five, five, and five, and hit apply, I've now divided five intersections through that shape, okay? So I can right click on the box, tell it to give me lattice points. And what I can do is I can come in here and now I can start moving these points around. So if I pull these points out first, like so, and then I'm going to come back in and grab all of these right here. And then I grab these out like this. Okay, I'm starting to get a natural bend inside that object. When I'm done, we don't delete the lattice. If I delete the lattice, the object pack pops right back into its original form. If I come over and touch the object, and delete the history, edit, delete all by type, and go to history, okay, the object will retain its shape. And if I hit three and smooth it, you can see how similar it is to that. Okay, I just use a, I used um, a lattice to create that shape instead. Okay, the next version, the next way we can do this is by using a deformer. So if I come back to the shape right now, and if I go back in the animation submenu, I come back over here under create deformers, and we go down to nonlinear. Okay, if I open up this little box, I touch the object. I'm going to tell it to go to bend. When I hit bend in there, where is it? You can see it put a little line in the middle. See that? So that little line in the middle, I can come over here. That's going to be react. It's going to react to the object. So if I came over here to bend, 
So watch what happens if I come over and I select curve and then I middle mouse button drag. See how it's bending the object right there? Okay. So, however, though, you notice it's bending left or right. I don't want it to bend that way. So having that selected, the, the bend curve in there, I'm going to go to rotate it, and I'm going to rotate it just 90 degrees. So I'm going to type in here negative 90. It's now rotated. Now watch when I hit curve. That's what I just did. But I had to rotate it 90 degrees to get it to interact with the object. Okay. So let's say that that's not what I wanted, though. Let's say I want to rotate it. I want to do what I did here. I want to put a bend on it. I want to put a curve. So I'm going to rotate it in this direction. I'm going to come back up here into my channel box. I'm going to type in negative 90. I always double check. Sometimes I over rotate. See that? That should be back at zero. Uh -uh. No, it shouldn't. That's fine. Let it stay there. And now that I have that, now let's hit curve and see which way it's rotating. Aha, do you see that? So now I'm able to come in there and I can rotate that shape any way that I like. I can put a natural bend on that. That's pretty cool. Once I get it to right there, okay, I touch the object, same principle as the other deformer of the lattice. I'm going to go right back under here and I'm going to tell it to, to delete by history and type. Okay. What happens if I select the bend deformer and delete it? The object pops back into its shape. We don't want to do that. So I select the object, come back under here, okay, and I'm going to go to Edit History. Where is it there? I have a hotkey for it. Alt-H is my hotkey. Let's find it this way. Where is it? Edit, Delete, All by Type History. Boom. Lattice, it's now gone, and now look at what I have. I have three guys that are all about the same bend, and they all look the same. So, again, in Maya, three or four different ways to do one thing sometimes, okay? All right, so let's just come over here. I'm just going to work on one of these guys for a little bit, and let's just talk about what happens and a couple of tools that we can use. So one of the things that happens right now is when I smooth this, going to the smooth mode, pressing 3, I get really distinct rounded edges and it comes to a point. Okay, well, if that's not what I want, I think we talked about this a little bit before, what we have to do is we have to find a way to put another edge inside here. Okay, and there's a couple ways that we can do that. All right, one way is I could select all the faces around the outside here and I can extrude them and then scale it in a little bit and then that'll create another secondary edge or lip around the two, the end. So I'm going to do that just to the end here to show you. Do you see how rounding that is? If I come here right now, if I go to face, if I select these three edges, these, make sure you don't select anything else. So watch, I'm going to go to extrude right now. I pull them up just a little bit like this. And I, can, and I hate it when it does that. I can press them in a little bit that way. And now I can press them in a little bit more like this. And I get just that little edge on there. Let's watch what happens now when I come back and I smooth it. It's not as round, is it? So by adding that little edge in there, do you see what it did? It started to create more of a harder edge. Now, it's not a complete hard edge. If I want to get a complete hard edge in there, I usually have to have three lines next to each other to retain the hard edge okay, to get it to work. So if I wanted to, I can come back in here right now. And this is where, you know, sometimes you have to mess with the vertices. So let me, let me come back in here and let me grab these vertices. What I'm going to do is drop them down a little bit closer and use my scale tool. Your scale tool is your friend. It usually divides out from the middle. It's a fantastic tool. It saves you a lot of time. When that's done, go back to shade mode. I'm going to write, uh oh, you know what? I noticed that right there. No, that's okay. That zigzags a little bit. Let me see if I can get it just about there. Problem is, is that this is a little bit more curved and this is a little different. So I, want, I don't want these to zigzag too much. What I might do really quick is just grab these vertices here and here. I just might use the scale tool and pull them out. So there's just sort of a little bit straight like that. So it's a nice, easy line over, okay? It's not too zigzag. Now when that's done, let's come in here. Let's go back to faces again. And I don't usually extrude. I usually insert an edge loop in there. But it's sort of the same principle. So let's say one, let's, I just want to show you options. I could extrude again. If I select those three faces, I extrude. I pull that out a little bit more. Watch, I want to try to get that in there so it's nice and smooth. I'm going to scale those in just a little bit, right? 
Now that that's done, I click off of it. I hit, I'm going to hit three. And now look at what happens, okay? Oops, hold on, I hate it. You have to touch off of it to see it. So that's the rough, and now when I hit the smooth, see what's happened? I put a nice, very distinct hard edge across there by adding a couple more of those grooves in, okay? So when you look at it, and I go back to the rough mode, go to one, you can see I got three lines going across. That's going to give me that hard edge. So the thing that sucks, though, is that I don't have that going along, along the rest of my body. It's up to you, depending on the part that you're making, right? And what's cool sometimes is sometimes if you just take a break and you look at what you're modeling, you know, and just wonder, like, what would happen if you took vertices, if this is in a smooth mode and you move them down, you might create a really cool-looking shape that you never thought you could create before, okay, just by using that smooth mode. So there's an option from going from here to here. I mean, that can be a really cool looking shape that connects up to something. And if I'm worried about those curves, all I have to go in is put another edge loop or two in there. Okay, and then I start to create a really cool looking, um, hold on, you have to touch something to click off there. So I start to create a really cool looking set there. Okay, but you'll see I get a little bit of distortion happening down there. And the reason why is that there's no edge loops in there. If I put an edge loop or two in there, it'll make it really smooth for me, okay? Now, let's let's do a couple other things to this. Let me just hit Command-Z. Let's see how far I can go back. Let's see if I can take off those edges. Oh, almost. We got to there. That's okay. So let's say we're there. I pulled this out. Another way is I could insert an edge loop in there, right? So if I come back over here and go to the Polygon submenu, and if I come over to, where is it? I have a hotkey for it. Insert, there's a couple. There's inter interactive split tool, insert edge loop here. If I click this, it gives me this little pointer. And then if I just come and touch, boop, it just drops a whole edge loop right in there for me. By doing that now, that's like me putting that third line in there that's going to give it a hard edge, OK? However, though, what's cool is I can also do it going in the other direction. So watch. One, two. One, two. Now it's wrapped the whole entire object, right? And now when I go to smooth this guy, and I go to three, see how the hard edge holds now? It's not a rounded edge anymore. There's a very distinct hard edge on there. Do you see that? Look at that hard edge going all the way around there. Why is there a hard edge on there? Because when I look at it in soft, in the low poly mode like this, I have three edges next to each other, okay? If I want to adjust that little hard edge fall off, now here, look at how here it looks a little weird, how it has that little indentation there. All I have to do is adjust what's right here, okay? So that would be the benefit. If you want to get a distinct, uh, an exact hard edge on something, you can come back in here and use my hotkey. So watch, I can come in here. I can go boom, boom, like that. So I inserted two edges in there. See that? Now, remember, when that edge loop is, is highlighted like that, it still works with scale. Do you see that? So what I should have done is after I inserted the first edge loop, if I take my scale icon and just scaled it up a little bit like this, see what that did? It raises it up just a little bit more. But then what I have to do is it also raised it up here a little bit more. So then I might have to come down here and manually pull those down. Okay, So sometimes just actually getting in here and doing this, grabbing the center of the scale. There, now it's scaled out from all edges. Let's come back here. I, I hit my hotkey for insert another edge loop. I'm going to touch right here. After that edge loop goes around the whole entire body right there, I'm going to come right back and I'm going to grab the center of that axis, right? See that? And when I grab that, I'm going to scale that up a little too. Just a teeny bit. Just to create a little bit more of like an edge. And it's scaled a little. I'm going to move it back just a little bit like that. Okay? Sometimes you have to go in and manipulate a couple parts to it. Like for some reason, when I was scaling, that pushed it back into itself right here. That's fine. All you have to do is select off of this back to vertices, and then you can grab a couple of the vertices and you can manually
lift them and move them, okay? That's why somebody, you don't want to do both sides at the same time, right? So that's why somebody might delete one half of it, do one side, get it the way that you want it, and then remember, I showed you guys how to merge vertices. Then you duplicate that side back, and then we merge all that would combine them, we merge the vertices, and it goes into one piece of geometry. But we could adjust that. That's a finite detail later. The thing is, is I inserted edge loops in there. So now when I hit smooth, look at what it does. It's not as rounded. Look at the difference. Huge difference. This thing totally rounds and is so smooth. This has much more of a hard edge on it. You see that? Much more of a hard edge, okay? But now, so now let's say I want to put some detail in here. There's things I want to adjust. Well, right here, I need a support because that curve is getting a little bent. It's getting let's see, distorted. It does this little square blocky thing in there. So all I have to do is do this. I come back in. I'm going to insert an edge loop right here. Bam. I'm going to come over here, try to match it up right in the middle. Eyeball it. Bam. Then I'm going to come over. I'm going to grab a couple of the vertices. Okay. Let's grab these and these. Let's pull them down a little bit. Like, so. uh oh, missed a couple. And pull these down a little. Now that I have that that second row in there, see how nice that curves? I have no major issues with that piece now. Okay. Let's see what else we can do. Well, we could pull shapes out. It's all kinds of things. It's it's up to your imagination. Okay. What if I want to take that and Let's just see what would happen. So you can leave it in three by pressing three, and you could watch what happens in smooth mode. So what I did is I just extruded, and I got that hole. Okay, I'm going to extrude again, push it into itself a little bit. Okay, and then I'm going to extrude again, push that down just a teeny bit, like that. And now I have a little hole in there because all I did is in this mode, I, ext I extruded it. Now that was a little sloppy. Something happened there. So let me go back to this right here. And now I'm going to extrude it in its base mode so I can see what's happening. I'll make sure I didn't have anything else. So there, I'm going to extrude there a little bit. There, now let's extrude this. Let's push this shape in a little bit. Remember, I always need two edges or else I'm going to have a rounded minimum of two. If I want to crisp, I need three, right? So to get the two, I'm going to extrude it one more time, push it down just a little bit, and then I'm going to extrude this out a little like so, and a little bit like that. Now let's go take a look. So now that that's done, if I press 3, see what I have? I'm starting to get a little hole shape in that, a little bit of a design element, right? However, though, my hole's still a little jagged. That's because I need some more supports in there. So watch. If I come back in, and if I say insert edge loop and I put an edge loop right in here going across I put one going in right here and I put one going in right here down the middle then I'm gonna go to vertices okay. I'm gonna grab these sets of vertices and I'm gonna move them back look through your object make sure you're not selecting something else I'm gonna move them over here and come back over here do the same thing try to mimic them exact distance like these bring these back a little bit like so grab this now bring this back now, because of everything I did right there, I'm going to have a much tighter circle because I put more supporting edge loops in there, right? So now when I click off of that and hit 3, go back to shaded mode. There. You see how I have a much nice, tighter circle? Okay, with more of a hard edge on it? Because I went back in there and added those extra sets in there, okay? All right. Let's say I don't want that. Let's go back a couple steps here. All right, so um, stay in this mode here. Just remember, if you want to create a nice hard edge on something, you'd have to have you have to have a couple edges next to each other. Okay. Now let's say for some reason, there's so many mo other things we can do with this, you guys. Here, let's try something else. What if I took these faces? and I extrude them outward. See what it might turn into. You want to make another detail instead of an interior circle? Look, extrude. Watch, pull them out a little bit like that. Okay, now remember, if I have two edges, we have a little bit better line. So watch, I'm going to move these back because then I'll have two edges right next to each other like this. Then I'm going to extrude again. Pull it out a little bit more to about there. What I'm going to do is I'm going to use this 
I'm going to rotate it just a little bit like so. Okay. So I rotated a nice little angle on there. I'm going to extrude again. This time I'm going to scale that in a little bit like that so I can get an edge on it. Scale it up a little bit more like that. Here I'm going to extrude one more time. Pull that out a little bit more. Okay, and what I did right there, when I smooth that now, see how cool that looks? I have a nice little added piece of, of geometry. I have the mesh that comes out, and I get that nice angled. Do you see how that could be a part from my robot's arm right here? That could be an element that attaches to the outside and has a nice curve to it. Okay? So it's sort of endless what I can do. Just go back to your poly mode, look at your poly, and see what you can think of. Okay, and in terms of reusing your shapes, look at what happens if I take this shape. I don't, all I have to do is just, oops, if I just move a couple vertices, I might end up with something totally different. Oops, the wrong hotkey there. Do you guys see what I did, how long that took me? It took me about three, I don't know, about five seconds. And I just pulled the curves down. I added another edge loop in there, and I folded out those shapes. And now when I hit smooth, look at my new shape that I have. Just not liking those edges on there. So I need, if I want to get those edges nice and round, I need to get in there and get a couple more edge loops happening. So you can see that. Remember that jagged edge look? So I think I pulled those down maybe a little bit too far. There's not enough support in there, enough typology to support that type of curve. So let me just bring that up a little bit more. What if I just keep them down about here? Hit three. See how I reused that shape, and now I have another shape that's just slightly different on top of it. And if I wanted to bend that over, roll it like this. I, and there's so many other things I could do. See how that could be now? Remember on Gigantamo, I had the shield, there were the shield plates on the shoulder. I could use that as a shield plate. I could start to bend that over. In fact, on since this one's a little bit different, I could come in here. Oh, hold on a minute. I notice he also went crooked a little bit. Let me fix that. Zero, he's turning at 14. That should be at negative zero. There we go. Okay. So if I want to come in here and add another element of detail, what else could I do? I don't know. Let's just say we went, let's go face. Let's say if we select these. Um, let's do them on both sides. Remember, you also have that reflection tool, right? You can use. And this is what sucks. They changed this in Maya couple versions ago they made this selection tool like super sensitive so when I used to be able to touch it and only certain faces would be selected here we go look through the object make sure those are the only faces selected I'm gonna extrude when I extrude first I'm gonna pull in the shapes a little bit like that okay then I'm gonna extrude again and I'm gonna pull that extrusion out a little bit and to come back I'm gonna scale it back down a little bit more like this a little bit into itself okay and then let's hit extrude one more time I'm gonna pull that back out just a teeny bit and see if I can't I'm just gonna try to scale it just a little bit more and then what I need to do is I'm gonna come in here I need to get a nice rounded edge there so I'm gonna select those vertices I come to this edge here, I'm going to select these vertices and use the scale tool. It's my friend. It's going to scale from the middle. I'm going to move that back out a little bit. And then I'm going to bring them back down a little bit like that. That's pretty cool. And then when I click off and I take a look and I smooth that guy, I now have a different shape. Now I have some deformation happening there because it's so close to that edge. I might need to work on that a little bit, but you can see what I'm going for how quickly I can start developing something. So again, what we want to do, just to reiterate this, this guy was just a cube I took and I expanded, okay? Take that time to figure out 
what your complicated shape might be and sit and make it and then smooth it and see what happens, okay? I wanted to try to make another shape. I might do this. Give me a minute here. I'm going to pause the, the recorder. And I wanted to try to use this Taurus to make a really cool shape. So maybe I'll do this with the recorder on real quick. What I thought of doing was extruding some faces out. That's way too round for me right now. I really want to simplify this guy. So under the inputs here, I can come down here. I can adjust the axes, bring them down to about, let's say I decide to go about 15 or so. And then subdivisions and height, way too tall. I'm going to bring it down to about here. See, this is great. I have a cool shape right there I can work with very quickly. Okay. All right. So give me a minute. I'm going to just pause the recorder. I want to try to make a cool exoskeleton armor plate thing that would be for like the arm, let's say, where I could fit mechanics of the arm inside. And I'm going to use this to guide me through. Let me stop the recorder because we're already at an hour. I need to back up there just a little bit. Okay.